All right, so this is chapter seven, and now we're going to take a look at cognitive development. Our learning objectives here is going to be looking at PSJ's four stages of cognitive development. We're going to talk about the theory of it itself and some of the criticisms that come with it. We'll then take a look at Vygotsky's sociocultural theory on cognitive development. We'll talk about attention, memory, executive functioning, as well as metacognition from childhood into adolescence. And then we'll kind of do a comparison of Piaget's and Vygotsky's theories and look at it in terms of information processing. So looking at Piaget's theory of cognitive development, Piaget, he was interested in a philosophical type of question when he began to think of uh, how we develop. And pretty much it came down to he wanted to know how we come to and how we understand our world in terms of uh, epipesemology. His approach basically was studying the development of the human mind by way of a synthesis of ideas, which drawn from earlier interests he had in terms of biology as well as in philosophy. So on one hand, he kind of looked at um, humans as an organism, as a, a biological species. And he felt that we had to adapt successfully within our environment just to survive. So if you flip that coin, he also looked at how more unique characteristics we had as humans. And with it, the ability to be able to reflect as well as understand, to ponder as well as how that all came to about and came together in terms of a working mechanism. So what we'll be looking at is how both approaches when it uh, was contributed into a genetic epipesemology, which of course the genetic is the bi biological component and the philosophical component is the epi epipesemology. <laughs> um, and from that comes the cognitive development. So there's been a lot of different developmental researchers who kind of claim that Piaget revolutionized the study of children's cognitive development. And though uh, his theory has received a lot of criticism. It has also undergone revision over the years. It's been able to provide at least a set of basic principles in which we take a look at cognitive development in, as a guide for research today. So more or less, this is going to include several different ideas that um, stem from this, that being as far as intelligence, uh, how it's an active, constructive, and dynamic process. It's not just a standard uh, or static. And then it's taking a look at the general flaws or mistakes children would make within their thinking uh, as usually meaningful because those mistakes actually will reflect how uh, their thought processes will come and mature within each stage of the development. So as a child develops that structure of their thinking, it'll change. And it's those new modes of thought that's going to be based on earlier structures that have been developed. Now, in terms of how it was first discussed about these basic ideas, Piaget, you know, he looked at cognitive development of, of how it occurred, and then he described it within four stages of development. So, Piaget felt that we're always going to be actively trying to make sense of our life, of our experiences, in order to be able to adapt uh, with the environment and ensure our survival. Uh, so in terms of when he thinks about making sense, what he means is how we organize our experiences into what we, he called schemas, which schemas is looking at those frameworks, cognitive frameworks that would take the concepts of objects objects as well as experience and categorize them into groups of associations. Each person is unique in a way of organizing those experiences based on the schemas that you would develop. So 
when we talked about assimilation, assimilation happens when we're modifying or changing new information to help it fit into what we already know, which is the schema. It helps us to maintain and keep new information or experiences and adds to what already exists in our mind. So an example you could think about in terms of assimilation would be how an infant using a sucking schema, uh, it was developed by sucking on a, a bottle or the breast nipple when attempting to uh, suck on a larger bottle. That's how they would be able to do the assimilation. So they started with the breast and then they might have moved on to the bottle. They assimilated to be able to continue and for survival mode to be able to eat. Now, when we talk about disequilibrium, now this happens when we kind of experience some confusion uh, in which our schemas are not really fitting with the experience. So in this example, think about a child trying to learn how to tie their shoes. Uh, they, also, they may face a state of disequilibrium as he or she try to physically maneuver those laces while thinking through the steps as he or she tries to come up with a new schema for a shoe tying. Now, people generally are going to find some uncertainty when it comes to disequilibrium because it's uncomfortable. You, it's like when you don't know something, you, you, it feels awkward. You feel a little anxious, uncomfortable. So usually what happens is you'll try to make sense of what's going on and try to see it in order to return it to a more comfortable state. This is what Piaget refers to as equilibrium. Okay, And when we speak about accommodation, now that's in this particular um, area, this is when we take it, restructure uh, something that's been modified some of something we already know so that that new information is going to fit even better. It results from problems that's been posed in the environment and when our perceptions didn't fit it in correctly, well now we know what we want to know or think. We're going to reshape it, fix it so that we understand it better. So I have for you uh, a little film here that hopefully provide further explanation uh, in terms of the stages of cognitive development. I'm go it's going to get repetitive throughout these slides because I really want this to uh, kind of hit home. So rather than hearing my voice throughout, I'm going to every once in a while bring in something else to kind of help with the studying process. Piaget's theory argues that we have to conquer four stages of cognitive development. Piaget's First, the sensory motor stage. Piaget's theory argues that we have to conquer four stages of cognitive development. First, the sensory motor stage. Second, the pre-operational stage. Third, the concrete operational stage. And fourth, the formal operational stage. Only once we have gone through all the stages, at what age can vary, we are able to reach full human intelligence. Ages birth to two. One. The sensory motor stage, In the sensory motor ages stage, birth to we two. Develop through experiences and movement In the sensory five motor senses. stage, we develop our through experiences and movement hear, our five smell, senses. Our brain wants to see, possible. hear, first, smell, taste, and reflexes. touch as and much as possible. We first, we start with simple from reflexes, old, and soon after, we, we develop our first habits. Our body. From and four months old, older, we become aware of things beyond our own body. And then as we get older, we learn to do things intentionally. A key milestone is the development of working memory, or in Piaget terms, our realization of object permanence. Before that, our mum can show and then hide a teddy, and we would think it's gone. After, we understand that objects continue to exist, even when we can't see them. We want to smell flowers. We start becoming food, curious about everything. Sounds, we want to smell flowers, 
taste food, listen to sounds and talk to strangers. To explore more, we move. We learn to sit, crawl, stand, walk and even to run. This increased physical mobility consequently leads to increased cognitive development. But we remain egocentric, meaning we can perceive the world only from our own point of view. Two, the pre-operational stage, ages two to seven. Our thinking is mainly categorized through symbolic functions and intuitive thoughts. We have lots of fantasies and believe objects are alive. As we are not able to apply specific cognitive operations, Piaget calls this stage pre-operational. We learn to speak and understand that words, images and gestures are symbols for something else. When we draw our family, we are not concerned about drawing each person to scale, but rather with their symbolic meanings. We love to play pretend, which allows us to experience something new and learn a lot. At around age four, most of us become very curious and ask many questions. We want to know everything. We can call it the birth of primitive reasoning. Piaget calls it the intuitive age, because while we realize that we have a vast amount of knowledge, we have no idea how we acquired it. Our thinking in this stage is still pretty egocentric. We think others see the world like we do, and still don't understand that they see it differently. Ages 7 to 11. 3. The concrete operational we stage. Ages 7 logic, to 11. We, develop concrete cognitive operations, we finally discover such as logic and we develop concrete order. cognitive operations, such as, objects, such as sorting objects in a certain order. One example of this is inductive reasoning, which means that if we see someone eating a cookie, we, we can draw a conclusion and then make a generalization. We that if we and we now get the concept of conservation. We understand that if we pour orange juice from a normal glass to a taller one, the amount stays the same. Our younger sister will pick the taller glass, thinking she gets more. By the same logic, we only now can understand that if 3 plus 5 equals 8, then 8 minus 3 must equal 5. Our brain learns to rearrange our thoughts, to classify and build concrete operational mental structures. For example, we now know that we can reverse an action by doing the opposite. Excited by our new mental abilities, we apply them in conversations, activities, when we learn to write and in school. As a result, we get to know ourselves better. We begin to understand that our thoughts and feelings are unique and not necessarily those of others. That means that we learn to put ourselves in someone else's shoes. Four, the formal operational stage, age 12 plus. Four, the formal operational stage, age 12 plus. Once we become teenagers, we become formally operational. We now have the ability to think more rationally about abstract concepts and hypothetical events. Our advanced cognitive abilities allow us to understand abstract concepts, such as success and failure, love and hate. We form a deeper understanding of our own identity and our morality. We now also think that we understand why people behave the way they behave and as a result, can become more Our compassionate. Can now do deductive reasoning, which means we can compare Our two brain can now do deductive reasoning, which means we can compare two statements and reach a logical generalization. Our new mental skills, mental skills and allow us to plan our life systematically no and prioritize, and we can make assumptions about events that have no necessary relation to reality. We can now also our philosophize and just identity. think about now thinking itself. Our new sense for our identity now also creates egocentric thoughts. thoughts and some start Piaget to see an imaginary in audience learning, watching them all the time. Piaget believed in lifelong learning, but insisted that the formal operational stage is the final stage of our cognitive Jean development. Jean Piaget's first interests were animals, and he published his first Albino scientific paper on albino sparrows in 1907, in 1907 he when he was just 11 years old. In 1920, he, he began working with 
with standardized intelligence tests. He realized that younger children consistently make types of mistakes that older children do not. He concluded that they must think differently and spent the rest of his life studying the intellectual development of children. Okay, so again, as a reminder, the four stages of um, Piaget's cognitive development would be sensory motor stage, that's birth to two years, pre-operational stage, which is covering from ages two to seven. Then we have the concrete operational stage, that's from seven to 12 years old. And then finally, last but not least, formal operational stage which happens between ages and the rest of your life. So with that, we'll go to the next slide and keep on speaking about Piaget. All right, so let's take a little more in depth look at uh, the sensory motor stage. As we know, when it comes to learning, it begins in the first month of life. And Infants are going to begin to start adapting reflexes that's going to help them to survive in the world. So between eight, uh, one to four months of age, a baby's usually going to start demonstrating reflexes in several different ways. First way, of course, is the sucking reflex, and that's at birth, okay, in which based on just that slight touch, a baby's going to automatically move toward the finger because it's going to have that sucking reflex. Um, but we also know that eventually once the baby learns about either the breast, if they're being breastfed or if they're being fed by a bottle and at that sight of it, that sucking reflex is going to start automatically. Well, here within the first four months, those other different type of reflexes happens more or less because of the result of it feels good to the infant, okay? It's a pleasurable experience. So usually what happens is automatic when they see that bottle or they see the breast, they know they're gonna be fed and it's gonna feel good. So therefore it's, it's repeated and the infant will repeat it over and over again. So think about also in terms of thumb sucking, this is something that is one of the hardest behaviors to break. There are individuals it goes into adulthood because of the pleasure received from it. Um, but Piaget calls this a circular reaction because they go back to what makes them feel good. Okay, So the action produces the good feeling and then prompts the infant to continue that action. And that good feeling will continue to stimulate the action over and over again, thus the circular fashion, circular reaction. Now between four to eight months, infants will start to use more intentional type of actions to kind of prolong or lengthen the interest of something that they see or different sights. And this is referred to as secondary circular reactions. So the different uh, circular reactions for the baby starts to develop. You could think of like motor schemas. Here, babies are, will organize their understanding of the world through the actions that they do. And we all know that if you give an eight month old an object, the first thing that a uh, baby's gonna do is put it in their mouth. Because what? They get pleasure from the mouth, starting with the uh, sucking reflex, they know that it feels good, so a lot of New times, babies aren't quite sure what happens to objects when they leave their sight. Sky's mom now, keeps disappearing and reappearing. No wonder Peekaboo is so much fun. Though, to be able to understand how the world is. During their first year, however, infants will learn an important concept, object permanence. Everything has a life of its own, even if it is out of sight. But let's see them a little further on. At Maya's age, babies know to look for the object, but they might not have everything else straight. Ten-month-old Simon is about to make a classic mistake, known as the A, not B error. Although he watched us place the toy plane under the white cloth, he'll look for it where he last found it, not where he watched us hide it. 
start grasping at things. They're going to start. If a one year old can't find an object they want um, right away, course, they're the likely to give up looking. In a combination to be able to reach the goal, to discover what it is that they're now dealing with. Usually, though, at the end of this stage, and that's going to be really going toward the 12 to 18 months range, infants will start to, to demonstrate new type of behaviors, which is going to allow them to achieve those goals even easier. This is what we call tetrary circular reactions. So although um, the actions are going to be repeated over and over, when it's done now, it's more with a planned design. So now they're going to see, well, what happens when I do this? Piaget felt that infants really don't understand that objects or people, for that matter, exist outside their own little world. So he felt that what the problem is, is that they lack object permanence. Now, the following video that you're going to about to see discusses object permanence in a little more detail. New babies aren't quite sure what happens to objects when they leave their sight. New Sky's mom keeps disappearing sure and reappearing. No wonder Peekaboo is so Sky's much fun. During their first year, however, infants will learn an important concept. Object During permanence. Their first year, however, Everything has a life of its own, even if it is out of sight. Everything At Maya's age, babies know to look for the object, but they might not have everything age, out straight. Ten-month-old Simon object, is about to make a classic mistake, known as the straight. A, not B error. Although Simon he watched us place the toy plane mistake, under the white cloth, he'll look for it where he last found it, not where he watched us hide it. If a one-year-old can't find an object they want right away, they're likely to give up looking. If a one-year-old can't find an object they want right away, they're likely to give up looking. All right, so as we've seen, infants, they really, it's hard for them at that, during that stage to realize that although they might not see it, that an object can actually still exist or a person can still exist. So can you imagine why a child might have separation anxiety uh, at that age if mommy leaves the room? Uh, finally though, at the end of the sensory motor stage, it's, the thought is, Piaget felt that from our, those behaviors uh, and the circular reactions, infants, they start to understand the behavior and being able to create their schemas to demonstrate more of a mental representation. All right, so let's take a little deeper look at the pre-operational stage. So continuing with cognitive development and Piaget's stages, we're gonna move on to childhood development. Here we have the pre-operational stage. This covers the preschool years from about two to six, depending on the person. So what makes something pre-operational? To answer that, we need to know what operational is. An operation is a mental ability to figure something out in one's head. It's like problem solving or trying to do a math problem in your head. Well, young children can't quite do this yet, so they're pre-operational. Okay, so with us knowing that, a lot of times, pretty much within this stage, children will utilize symbols. And symbols play a major part uh, as far as helping to liberate children from the immediate physical world. Piaget also placed a big emphasis on those type of limitations that's within children's thoughts during this uh, stage. So the next thing I'm going to talk about are the three limitations uh, that is characterized within pre-operational thought. That being intuitive thought, egocentrism, as well as the inability to be able to conserve. So starting with intuitive thought, this is happening around the age of three. And a lot of children, uh, this is that why stage. Let me just say first and foremost, that stage literally drove me insane with my youngest son. He was famous for why. 
you could not get through a conversation without why. If he asked about the sky, he said, Mommy, why is the sky blue? And you explained to him the, in terms that he would understand uh, about the science. And he would go, but why? And then if you continue, but why? So that why stage can be quite irritating to a parent. And you have to learn patience during this stage. However, pretty much getting back to this topic, they have some understanding of what they're seeing and experiencing, but it's still going to be just why. Everything that they see, they have to, again, get it to fit within that schema. Piaget talked about that he felt younger children, are, they're starting to put this stuff together logically uh, to be able to explain it, but yet they're still going to be impacted by their perceptions rather than any type of logical reasoning. This is what he called that initial reasoning of intuitive thought. So in the pre-operational stage, kids, you know, children are going to uh, make conclusions based off of unrelated type of facts. Uh, there's assumptions that it's going to just be happening for them at about the same time that will cause for it. So another example might be, and a textbook discusses this, is an angry child accusing an innocent bystander of doing harm uh, by reasoning, well, you were there when I fell, so it's your fault that I got hurt because the child might have been, a person might have been walking past at the moment the child fell. Even though we understand at our age that it was just a bystander at the moment of the incident. But to expect a two or three year old to be able to understand that situation is a mute point, okay? So the next uh, area uh, that's a limitation is what Piaget called egocentrism. And this is the belief that young children, they're gonna find it difficult to be able to see the world based upon anybody else's so continuing with cognitive development uh, and Piaget's staging, particularly that point we're going to move on to childhood development. From theirs, Here we have okay? the pre-operational stage. That's egocentrism. This covers and the preschool pretty much years ego from about two to six, depending I on the person. So, so what makes something pre-operational? To answer that, we need to know what operational is. An operation is a mental ability to figure you something out in one though, head. In it's like problem solving or uh, trying to do a math problem in your head. Well, young children can't quite be, do this yet, so they're uh, pre-operational. A person being selfish uh, or egotistic, you know, thinking they're better than everybody. No. What this is is that a child's really not understanding yet that the world exists larger than themselves. And it is, you know, that their mind is just not fully developed to realize that the world around them is in a different perspective other than their own. So it might feel that they're being selfish because they'll grab toys from others, but the reason is they don't realize yet that it might be someone else's toy, even though they, they think it's theirs, the realization that it's not, isn't in place yet, okay? Um, so when we think of it, though, in terms of adult, we're, we're able to start setting limits, um, particularly uh, for a child's behavior during this age. And the, one of the things that's important when we're speaking about child psychology and understanding the development in terms of helping with appropriate behaviors, we got to know that children are going to start becoming more aware of thoughts and feelings of others, but we have to help guide that somewhat because in this stage, it's not realized at that point yet. So then the third limitation is speaking about conservation or the lack thereof. This here is an extremely important cognitive skill, conservation in the pre-operational stage because children really haven't acquired conservation at this point. They're not understanding that the quantity of something like the amount of coins or the amount of water in a, a glass, which is a study that was demonstrated, um, or a mass, they don't have that uh, ability to think 
about them in different terms yet. So as far as they're concerned, it's always going to be the same. So let's take let's talk about uh, one example being uh, the textbook provides clay. Uh, yeah, As a matter of fact, I have a piece of clay. It's a beat up piece of clay, but it's still clay. So at this point, when an infant sees clay at this, like this, they're like, well, okay, that's clay. But if you turn it around and change it, and now you see a face on it, it's changed. For them, the ability to recognize and understand that it's still the same piece of clay really hasn't registered yet in their head, okay? You haven't been able to add or change if you smash it, which this is hard as a rock right now because it's old, but say I break it open and I smash it and I flatten it, it starts out, oh, it's too old, it's crumbly, but it makes a good point. When you show them a piece of clay like this, if I got it there, this is how they'll see it. This is how it registers in their brain. But now if I take that same piece of clay and flatten it, now it's flat. According to Piaget's theory in terms of conservation or the lack thereof, they won't see this still as the same piece of clay. Now I have a totally different piece of clay to them, okay? So it's in this appearance that they're really not able to see that new shape as being the original lump of clay, okay? So that talks about intuitive thought, egocentrism, the lack of conservation. I want y'all to make sure you read the entire section so that you have a full understanding within your text, as well as get a good understanding about the pre-operational stages of within cognitive develop, development. Excuse me. All right, so let's move on. Now let's take a look at concrete operations. During roughly the elementary school years, from about 7 to 11, give or take, children move into the third stage of cognitive development, according to Piaget. He called this stage the concrete operational stage. Now, we already defined operation as the ability to figure things out just in one's head. So this is the primary skill at this age. One of the best examples of this is how children at this stage can do basic math just in their head. For example, 5 plus 5 is 10. They no longer need to count, add, or subtract using their fingers or other objects. Conservation is now possible because of the mental capability of saying something like, oh, well those two look different, but I know that that's really the same. Concrete refers to the fact that children in this stage reason and think about concrete things, not abstract ones. Abstract ideas and reasoning happen in the next and final stage of cognitive development, formal operations, which begins in adolescence. All right, so as it was mentioned, we're talking about the, uh, in terms of concrete operations here, children, they're able to start thinking more logically, but there's still limitations during this period. Um, because they really During can't go into the years, abstract. For about seven and there's to 11, two give or type take, of uh, children cognitive move into advances the third stage of that enables the concrete PJ. operational he thinking, called stage the those being reversibility and classification. Now, we already define now, operation once as the ability to figure these things out just skills, in one's head. They're going to be able so to this solve is the primary skill at this age. One of the best examples of this is how children at this stage can do basic math just in their head. For example, five plus five is ten. The they no longer need to count add, or subtract using their fingers when they're or other judgments objects. About conservation conservation is now possible because of the mental of capability of saying something like, oh, well, well those two look different, to identify but different I know that that's really the same. And be able to have them concrete uh, relate refers to the in fact that children in this stage reason and think about another. concrete things, and pretty much not abstract being able to use Abstract ideas and reasoning happen in the next and final stage of cognitive development. Now, one component of the classification skill would be the ability to group objects according to some type of dimension that can be shared. And that ability is going to allow for subgroups with, within a hierarchy uh, to be developed into new groups, which will include the previous subgroups. So think of it like this. 
a child <clears throat> PSA found that children in the pre-operational stage kind of had difficulty understanding that a class would include a number of subclasses. So a child shown four red flowers and then two white ones, they were asked, are there more red flowers or more flowers, period? A typical five-year-old would say there's more red ones. Here, Piaget talks about how the child would focus more on one aspect, which is either going to be in that class or subclass. And this is what also is considered to be called a class inclusion. But it's not going to be until they can decentralize that he, they can simultaneously compare both the whole as well as it within the parts. You can think a little gestalt here, which makes up the whole. So a child then will start to understand relationships between class and subclasses. And so last but never least, let's look at formal operations. 12, 12 to adult. To adult. The stage, the stage we are looking, we are looking at, today at today is the fourth is the stage, stage of development, development the formal operational, operational stage. stage. At this, At this stage, stage children, children are able to reason, reason about abstract, abstract concepts, concepts, think about think consequences of potential actions, actions, and they're able to reason out what might evolve to adulthood. Also, thought that the stage we are looking at today is the fourth stage of development, the formal place. operational at stage. Children are reasoning more like adults. And At this stage, children are able to reason about abstract concepts, think about consequences of potential actions, and they're able to reason out what might occur. Also, Piaget thought that this is where really sophisticated moral reasoning began to take place. Basically, at this point, children are reasoning more like adults, and they continue to develop that over time. A hallmark characteristic of formal operational thinking is the ability to think about abstract ideas and also the ideal. So for instance, we start to wonder about what we believe, about our religion, about politics, and whether what our parents told us are really beliefs that we hold. Later developmentalists have come along and figured out that the stages aren't quite so discreet as PJ may have originally thought. Alright, so... <clears throat> Along with that, we know that this is moving from adolescence and it goes all the way into adulthood. And only, not only um, I want you to understand about our abilities to do abstract thinking, but I do want you to realize and understand the term about hypothetical deductive reasoning. This is something that is developed in, during this stage. It's our ability to think scientifically by generating predictions or hypotheses uh, about the world that we live in and how to go about answering those questions. So a person would approach problems more in a systematic and organized manner than they would through trial and error, okay? So that covers the four stages of uh, cognitive development and we're gonna keep pushing forward. Now, Besides Piaget, we've had other theorists who have also uh, followed along working within uh, Piaget's stages of cognitive development. David Elkind, he was one of those individuals who proposed that egocentrism comes back and comes back during earlier adolescence. And what happens is it makes it hard for uh, teenagers to be able to see the world uh, from other uh, perspectives. So although egocentrism is, is going to be different here than for the pre-operational stage, Elkind felt that adolescent egocentrism is going to be actually produced more through imaginary audiences as well as personal fables. So when he talks about the imaginary audience, he kind of is talking about how uh, teenagers were feel that they're the center of other people's attention, similarly to the way they are in their own attention. In this case, though, teens are going to refuse to go to school because their hair might look bad based on what the textbook talks about, or they'll be more self-conscious because in terms of body structure. So the child, teenager's mind, the adolescent's mind during this time, it, they're, they're aware of their own flaws that they perceive to be flaws. And because of this, it's going gonna, it's gonna to make them feel that other teens are looking at them 
poorly like they look at themselves. So although it feels harsh and judgmental, uh, it can also be a positive because what it might do is it might allow a child hopefully to kind of try to structure themselves to develop and see things differently. Uh, are there times that it can be uh, uh, negative? Most definitely. Uh, when we talk about in terms of eating disorders and we talk about uh, other behavioral issues, that can stem up from this kind of situation based on this theory as well. So, of course, we're dealing with social media, and this has brought the concept of imaginary audiences to a whole new level. Now it's where they see themselves online, they are imagining themselves, and they actually may portray themselves differently. Uh, I know one, uh, I have a great niece who, she's changed her name. <laughs> she don't really care for her name, apparently. And she changed her name to what she feels it should be. Uh, she's changed her age because she felt that she was, uh, she should be older uh, and that it would be more uh, pleasurable for people to see her in, as a more mature person. And because of this, it's where her imaginary audience that she has within her mind will now see her as what she feel is appropriate and adequate or efficient. But Elkind, he kind of developed uh, what we call the imaginary audience scale. And it, what it does is it measures uh, the acts, different facets of uh, adult egocentrism. So pretty much looking at the scale, there's, uh, you can find it in your textbook, but it's, it's given stories that would assume that the events actually happened to you. And what you would have to do is you would check what best describes your, your yourself in a real situation if it occurred. So do go to your textbook and read those questions. I'm not going to read those aloud. In turn of personal fables, personal fables is where they're bringing themselves into what they seem and appear. Like I mentioned of my great niece, she changed her name from one thing and made her name into a flower. <laughs> I won't say the name, but because <laughs> she found uh, flowers to be more appealing. So with her personal fable, she has developed this whole new character, so to speak, of herself. That she would rather say, this is who I am and this is what I believe in. Okay, and pretty much fable is storytelling. So she tells a different story about herself. Okay, so of course, within uh, child psychology theorists, there's been critiques and criticisms in regards to Piaget's work. One of those criticisms uh, that was by Carlson and Boots guests in 97, they, they had concerns about the terminology that Piaget used. So from a sci scientific viewpoint, they felt it was necessary to be able to define terms operationally so that uh, if it's defined operationally, it can be duplicated. Piaget often didn't do this, so it was difficult for other people to be able to uh, find the significance of general findings because they it's not easily or precisely replicated. So think of it like this um, in terms of accommodation and assimilation. Piaget offered these terms up to indicate a change that occurred for a child, but what exactly changed? Piaget really doesn't offer a specific operational uh, definition that would be able to guide researchers to find a link between observed behavioral changes or um, changes uh, that had developed within the mind. So this lack of operational uh, definition, it made, more, made it more difficult to do research. And so it became a kind of impossible for others to uh, establish a cause and effect type of relationship among Piaget's variables. Then there's a major criticism that came from the nature of stage theory in itself. That being stages that might be more um, inaccurate or it could be just plain wrong. So Wheaton in 92 pointed out that Piaget 
he underestimated the development of young children. Uh, he took uh, information from Bauer and Harris that con conducted research and found that some children develop object per permanence earlier than Piaget uh, first explained. And then there's others that pointed out that pre-operational children, they are, they're probably going to be less egocentric than um, Piaget believed. So more or less uh, other uh, researchers such as Flavel and Wheaton, they show that even a three-year-old can be aware of things like an adult would, such as a card from the opposite side um, that's being seen as something new um, to view. Additionally, there's individual differences that might mean that children of similar ages, they can widen, uh, can be uh, widely seen across the different stages. In a matter of fact, some children may never achieve the level of formal operations according to these other theorists. So children that shows a mixture of different stages in their cognitive makeup uh, would be in point attempting to differentiate themselves at the different stages at all. Why would it be? So still yet, Piaget, there's criticism that Piaget offered no substantial type of evidence for any kind of qualitative differences in cognitive capacity between two children of different stages. More importantly, the aspect of Piaget's theory is that each cognitive stage would be different, and not just as a matter of a degree, but rather instead a child's type of thinking would be extremely different depending on, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, depending on the stage that they're in itself. So being able to provide evidence for qualitative differences between these stages really hasn't been achieved according to other theorists. This critique is basically gives more implications to some faultiness of Piaget's work. If each stage has been marked by a new type of uh, thinking, then as a child ages, shouldn't there be signs indicating the sudden acquisition of these certain abilities? Basically, it's the opposite in terms of Piaget's work. Children tend to be able to progress rather slowly and gradually. So Gray in 1994, he offered an example in terms of talking about conservation of numbers, which most children can understand around five years old in comparison to the um, conservation of substance, which would normally develop at around eight years old. While Piaget does talk about uh, some developments being slow, critics still argue that overall cognitive development is so slow as to um, obviate the need of a stage theory at all. Then there's other criticisms that would look at Piaget's act as an action-oriented type approach. Here they're talking about how Piaget believed that the physical manipulation of external objects is extremely important for normal cognitive development. Now, scientists and theorists have argued that children born without the physical capability of uh, an outward action, uh, such as if a child was born paralyzed, are still able to, and not able to move uh, certain limbs, are still capable of normal cognitive development. Additionally, those physical uh, aspects of Piaget's theory kind of fails to look at how children would understand abstract words that doesn't necessarily relate to an immediate physical object. Even still, we have other uh, criticisms, um, like in, in terms of what Vygotsky talked about, in terms of how it chastises Piaget's attention to non-attention to culturally specific type of influences in cognitive development. Piaget, he studied, you know, he studied in Geneva, which is a Western culture, and children there would attend school and are trained in certain forms of thinking. But what Piaget may not have looked at 
or might have ignored was the influences that's going to be attributed to a child's intellectual growth based on individual uh, reactions to the environment. So there's been tests that have shown that Piaget's formal operational period and even concrete operational um, stage really is dependent on formal Western uh, educational practices rather than any type of Eastern type practices. So those are just some critiques uh, and I've included a little more than what your textbook speaks about, but these are some of the uh, criticisms that's been provided in terms of Piaget's work. All right, so we're gonna now look at um, the theory of core knowledge. This is one of those more modern type theories that's gonna be looking at how uh, we as humans, we're born actually with more innate cognitive type systems for being able to understand the world around us. Um, and there are basic symptom, uh, systems that's really going to develop from our experiences rather than just represent a core base of knowledge that would be uh, appear to be built in the brain already. So there's the theory is of a direct challenge to Piaget's ideas that everything is constructed for children very basically um, in the nature of the objects as well as people through experiences. This theory is saying we already have that kind of wired within us and <clears throat> although researchers describe theory of core knowledge uh, that infants are born with certain basic knowledge, there's going to be some different ideas about exactly what set of knowledge they would possess. Okay. So this following video is a video from Elizabeth Spelke in terms of talking about what she considers to be the human spark. My personal view is that uh, what's most central to the sparking of uniquely human cognitive capacities is our capacity for language. And that it's when children really get going on the task of learning language, uh, learning their first words at nine or 10 months of age, putting words together. Uh, My personal view later, is that that's when we uh, start what's these most central to the sparking of uniquely human so cognitive Spelke capacities language is our capacity for language. Spark. And that it's when children really get going on the task of learning language, language allows children uh, learning to their first words words at nine or ten months of age, world. putting words so together a, a, uh, a few months later. And that's when we start seeing these uniquely human capacities emerging. So Liz Spelke sees language as ignighting the human spark. Them, Nora, guess what? She's exploring that idea by studying how language allows children to interpret maps as representing the real world. So you take and a two and a half year old child and show them bucket, okay? a two dimensional drawing There's that simply bucket. has a simple There's geometric figure on it, say a triangle, Kermit. and say to them, Nora, Which guess what? Is your Kermit. Favorite bucket? He has a favorite, favorite bucket that he likes right to sit here. in. There is Kermit one bucket one that he favorite. likes the best. Nora, and Kermit today we are going bucket? to put him in his favorite bucket, okay? Here's our picture of the room. Yay! There's one bucket. That's there's remarkable. another bucket. Yeah. And there's another bucket. But if you ask, Kermit, what have you which done one is your favorite bucket? My favorite is this one, right? You've yeah. talked to oh, them. Kermit said them. that this one is his favorite. There's another bucket. you put Kermit in his favorite bucket? And that raised the question, what if you didn't do that? Yay! That's a remarkable yeah. ability. But if you ask, what have you done with this child to engage this ability, to engage this symbolic function? You've talked to them. You've told them. There's one bucket. There's oh, another bucket, that and there's Nora, another bucket. And that raised the, the question, what if you didn't do that? What if you simply showed them the Can piece of paper and said, bucket? there's one, and Yay. there's another, Good job. and there's Got another. The picture. Now, you want to get Kermit, Kermit favorite which is your favorite room? one? Which is Kermit's favorite bucket? Without the cue of language, oh. notice that unlike Nora, Xander isn't told that the spot on the, the map represents a bucket. You. Can you put him in his favorite bucket? And they have this ability. Yay! Good job! You got him on the picture. We want to get Kermit in his favorite bucket in the room. Which is Kermit's favorite bucket? Without the cue of language, Xander wasn't able to relate the map to the real world. But when he's prompted. I'm going to give it doesn't develop at birth. 
we don't and they see have it, this um, ability, uh, you think, because they're age. already uh, but as far manipulating as I can see, symbols that's in language. Exactly. Exactly. And as far as I can see, that ability develops spontaneous. Okay, so Spelke and Kinsler, Kinsler, back in 2007, they kind of found and demonstrated four different areas of core knowledge. That being the first one, the knowledge is going to be about objects that moves as a cohesive unit. It's not, uh, it doesn't have contact with another object unless they're close to each other. And then it'll move on a continuous path with it. The second one is going to be the knowledge that agents, which would be people basically, um, would act purposefully toward a specific goal. So babies at this stage would know that objects are not going to act with a goal in mind the same way that people would. The third one is talking about limitations with knowledge, uh, specifically of a number that's experienced within everything. So one example the textbook provides is hearing a number of tones or seeing a number of different objects. And this understanding is not going to be exact, but it gets more uh, less precise if that number gets even larger. So knowledge of numbers would also include having an understanding about adding and subtracting. OK, the fourth one would be spatial relationships. And this type of knowledge is including how we would use shapes in our environments to be able to find out where um, one might be when they become disoriented. So say, for example, you're trying to find a location you've been walking around. Um, our abilities is, is kind of innate that we kind of know, OK, we went we came from this way. We came from the left. So I'm going to go back right, which would turn left. You do the opposite to get yourself back to where you started. So now we'll take a look at Vygotsky's sociocultural theory of cognitive development. Vygotsky's theory of social development argues that community and language play a central part in learning. While Jean Piaget concluded that children's cognitive development happens in stages, Vygotsky rejected his ideas and believed that children develop independently of specific stages as the result of social interactions. Vygotsky claimed that we are born with four elementary mental functions attention, sensation, perception, and memory. It is our social and cultural environment that allows us to use these elementary skills to develop and finally gain higher mental functions. This development ideally happens in the zone of proximal development. First, there is what we can do on our own. Then, there is the zone of proximal development, which represents what we can do with the help of an adult, a friend, technology, or what Vygotsky called the more knowledgeable other. Last, there is what's beyond our reach. To illustrate this, let us think of twins who were raised in a community in which boys are expected to learn and succeed, while girls are only expected to be pretty. At the age of 10 months, both have the ability to crawl and are in the zone of proximal development for learning how to stand on their feet. The more knowledgeable other, in this case the father, provides the boy with opportunities to practice in a playroom that he is equipped with scaffolding and other objects. The boy is encouraged to explore the equipment and eventually he uses it to pull himself up. A few hours later, he's cruising along the structures, and a few days later, he's standing on his feet. The girl also has the potential to stand, but does not receive any support in learning the skill. When we compare the two, we see that while the girl is still trying to get up, the boy has moved into a new zone. He knows how to balance while standing, and now has the potential to learn how to walk. Both will eventually learn how to walk, but according to Vygotsky, the boy will be more skilled. The same principles apply to all learning and the development of higher cognitive functions. 
and only those learning with the assistance of a capable mentor can reach the full potential of their ability. Vygotsky, therefore, believed that inside the zone of proximal development, learning can precede development, which means that a child is able to learn skills that go beyond their natural maturity. He also established an explicit connection between speech and mental concepts, arguing that inner speech develops from external speech by a gradual process of internalization. This means that thought itself develops as a result of conversation. Therefore, younger children who don't finish this process can only think out loud. Once the process is complete, inner speech and spoken language become independent. Lev Vygotsky died of tuberculosis in 1934, at the age of 37. Despite his young age, he became one of the most influential psychologists of the 20th century. He left the following advice for educators. By giving students practice in talking with others, we give them frames for thinking on their own. What do you think? Can a child learn anything regardless of any developmental prerequisites? And do we learn only through social and cultural contexts? And if so, do you think it is appropriate for a more knowledgeable other to determine what a child should learn next? Share your thoughts in the comments below. All right, so as the video described, it gave you examples of zone of proximal development, which again, this is where a child will start out with something, but it only improves as far as through the experience of others. Scaffolding, just remember, is that it's that helping tool for a zone of proximal development, meaning that when you're building, scaffolding is going to be like a temporary structure that will be used to help support, say, a work crew, for example, in this instance, the child and the parent, in um, dealing with the materials that they're trying to learn it, that's going to help in constructing and improving on what they're trying to learn. So. In early childhood education, this is working most of the way, the same way it would as if someone was building a house, for example. So the idea really is that new lessons and concepts can be really readily understood and comprehended if their support is given to a child as they're learning this information. It's going to also be able to uh, involve teaching a child something new by utilizing those things that they already know. Now, let's move on to information processing. This is one of those major contemporary approaches um, in studying cognitive development. Here we're looking at uh, how the information is being presented. Uh, it's going to be more concise. There's going to be different approaches. Uh, and that's been proven through a lot of different research studies that's been conducted. Yet, it doesn't really fit into one single type of framework that all the others have. So more or less when we're talking about uh, information processing, we're talking about how we can manipulate it within our minds to be able to think about how we're able to take in new tasks. And this, thing, this would include uh, working with our attention, our memory, levels of executive function, as well as metacognition. So attention how well attended are you at particular tasks we have two types that we contend with selective attention and sustained attention and more or less when we say attention it's meaning that how a person would focus their mental processes on something okay be that this lect video lecture for example as this is a little longer than what we tend to do in the classroom how long are we able to pay attention? And when we're paying attention, we have to, it involves certain dynamics to help turn, you know, tune things out, which would be the selective, as well as being able to maintain, maintain the focus over time, which is what we call sustained attention. So as we're talking about this particular area, we're gonna be looking at how the aspects of attention would uh, develop 
from infancy all the way into adolescence and try to take a look at what happens when attention really um, doesn't occur right for certain children. And when that happens, we have a, a disorder called attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. So we'll be looking at how infants, you know, they'll look at something uh, that they haven't seen before and they're going to give it their full, full attention at that point. And more or less, infants look at things that's novel, they, you know, stuff that's really bright and enjoyable. Uh, and it helps them to be able to gain focus to the world around them. And they'll keep attention in that order. But on the flip one of coin of that, because it's novel, they'll start losing interest eventually and then they're going to want to see something new. So more or less what we have to do is help a child uh, keep that focus and that's through the process of habituation. So the textbook provided you an example about how you may enter a room that's got a noisy air conditioner, like right now my air conditioner is extremely noisy. But my focus has been on this video lecture rather than the uh, air conditioning. And part of that is because my brain has allowed it to filter out through habituation. It's something that I've known has existed. It's, my mind knows that it's there and it's present, that it's not something that I have to pay attention to. And therefore, what I have to focus on, which would use selective attention in this case, and then sustaining that attention, would be this video lecture. So that would be one way of seeing it. So you would be able to habituate that sound and you're not going to pay attention to it anymore. Uh, in terms of research and when we're doing uh, observations in, in a laboratory setting, habituation has been able to be used to assess many different aspects of, of cognition, particularly with infants, uh, so that we can maintain and keep them within the experiment itself. So the procedure would call for like an object for an infant to uh, look over and over again and then what we do is we'll record how long the infant will look at that object um, and we would annotate the times that been uh, noted. So usually infants are going to start losing interest over the object we give them and it'll decrease over the amount of time spent looking at it. So what happens is we take a look at the rate of habituation and seeing how quickly the infant will start losing that interest. Um, through repeated showings. And then that allows us to be able to measure the length of attention that's given to it. Now, we're gonna move into talking about attention. Uh, we talked about infancy. Let's talk about childhood development and childhood. Uh, experts here have generally said that there's a reasonable amount of attention span that would be expected of a child who's between, it would be between two to three minutes uh, per year of their age, okay? So saying that the period of time for which a typical child can maintain focus on a given task, probably if they are five years old, then you can, you can estimate if we're saying two to three minutes that it would be between 10 to 15 minutes of time that would be uh, spent on attention for that particular object. So a way of describing it more is looking at the average uh, attention spans that would go something like this. So for a two-year-old, we'll say between four to six minutes. Four is going to be eight to 12 minutes. A six-year-old would be 12 to 18 minutes. Eight years old would be between 16 and 24 minutes. A 10 year old, now you're talking about 20 to 30 minutes. Uh, and then at 12 years old, between 24 and 36 minutes. And if we go up, I'll just say jump to 16 years old. At that point, a 16 year old attention span would range between 32 to 48 minutes. One thing I want to uh, make note of is that there are some developmental researchers that have said that the upper limit of five minutes per year of a child's age, meaning a two-year-old actually would be able to focus on the task up to 10 minutes at a time. But of course, 
these are just generalizations. So how long a child is truly able to focus is going to really be determined by other factors like how many distractions might be nearby within a room. Is the child hungry at that time or are they sleepy? Uh, these are all different um, factors and variables that would have to be considered in order to discuss how interested they will be within a particular activity. So just like with this video lecture as an adult, it's now at a hour and 10 minutes. So at this point, I'm probably starting to lose your attention. It's a long, it's, there's no breaks in between unless you make the breaks, okay? So you wanna think about it in that same sense for a child. But if your child's attention span is shorter than average, then it's worth addressing that. There are ways that we can help a child uh, extend their attention span. A couple of different strategies that might be able to help a child find more focus. We have to be creative and, and able to provide the tasks that a child might not enjoy. So there's, think of it like this. One example can be if you have a kid who really dislikes math, they're not going to really want to focus on that homework when they have to bring it home. So the child, he's going to try to work out them problems and writing it down, he doesn't really want to be bothered. It's like, okay, five minutes, no, I don't want to do this no more. But what if, let's say this child is a six-year-old, for example. What if we had it where we introduced some toys or maybe allowed them to do finger painting to figure out the problems, to be able to problem solve? It would, it's going to make it easier at first, and then they can just take what they've done and then copy it by hand onto the paper. Now what you've done was instituted a little fun, which allowed them to refocus and do something that they actually enjoy doing while they are still working on their homework, okay? So there's a wide variety of different items, different tasks that kids can manipulate while they're trying to focus on these other tasks. You, it's being innovative in ways of being able to help them to maintain that, um, that, that attention. So when you see that you have a child though who feels overwhelmed or confused by a project, then you want to be able to help get rid of whatever distractions are around. So at a start of a task, you want to help them identify what's going to be their challenges in the first place. If they are struggling with addition, for example, you might want to help them go through the, the initial foundation process all over again and start scaffolding as Vygotsky had uh, uh, provided. So this way, it allows them to take things that they know, like if they know their ones, one plus one equal two, two plus two equals four, you want to help build on that. And this way it helps to also allow them to maintain focus on what they're actually trying to work on, okay? One other thing I wanted to talk about in terms of with childhood, there is a, a assessment that we've used and that's the Stroop test. Now with the Stroop test, this is a fun activity. I've, I've been trying to do it and I'll try to remember to send y'all the link so that y'all can try to do the Stroop test yourselves because it's actually a lot of hard work at paying attention. This, the Stroop test is taking words themselves that would have a strong influence over your ability, like say the colors, okay? And they utilize colors like red, blue, yellow, green. And pretty much what they do is they will have you say what the color of the word is. And for example, it might say, the word might be red but the color of the word that they use is blue. So it's expected for you to be able to say blue even though you're reading red. Um, pretty much what's happening here is that interference between the different information, pretty much of what the words are saying and then the color of the words. Your brain's kind of receiving these, these, these a conflict of interest here and it's, it's become problematic. So there's two theories that might be able to explain the Stroop effect. 
The first one being speed processing theory. Because with this test, yes, they want to see how fast you can do it. And with the speed of processing theory, we're looking at how the interference occurs because these words are going to be read faster to you than the colors are going to be named. Then we have the selective attention theory. And in this theory, it's the interference occurs because naming colors requires more attention than reading words. Okay? So think about it as this puzzle, it could be easier for a younger child than an older child or even us as adults. As I mentioned, I'll try to get this uh, to you um, so that you can uh, try this for yourself. And trust me when I say uh, it, 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 it'd be a mind blower for you. All right, so attention in adolescence, as I mentioned, time spans gets better and gets greater. Uh, but let's talk about multitasking. And I'm going to say not even just adolescents, but even in adulthood. A lot of people feel that they're supposed to do five or ten different things at the same time and that they're able to provide full attention to it. Remember, the brain is going to filter out what it feels that's going to be the most important compared to the least. So if you're trying to do five tasks at the same time, Guess what your brain is doing? It's saying, I really don't need this at this moment of time. So whereas, say, for example, you're watching this video lecture and you're cooking a, a meal and you are also trying to knit at the same time, whatever your brain feels is going to be the most important priority is what you're going to wind up giving more attention to. So, for example, your mind might be saying it's really important that I get this information Dr. Kearns Cooper is giving me right now. So, therefore, you're really paying attention to the video lecture. However, you were cooking pasta and your pasta is now mush because it overcooked. Okay, uh, if you were knitting at the same time, you wasn't looking at your uh, knitting uh, patterns and you missed a couple of spots on the way. So although multitasking sounds like a great thing for us to be doing, in reality is something that you have really poor results in when you think about it. So let's go further and move on. Now, <clears throat> There are times when people who have difficulties, and children particularly, will have issues um, with being able to pay attention. And there is a disorder that's found within uh, the DSM-5, and it's called Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. So this video is going to give you uh, some uh, information in regards to that. ADHD, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, is one of the most common mental disorders that develop in children. According to Dr. Ben Vitiello of the National Institute of Mental Health, nearly 5% of all school-age children may have the condition. The main symptoms of Attention Deficit Disorder are uh, hyperactivity, which means a motor activity that is not really aimed at specific tasks and it is developmentally inappropriate level of impulsiveness that are also considered to be abnormal for the developmental stage of a child and sometimes also combined with inattention, inability to concentrate on tasks long enough uh, in order to, uh, to complete the task that the child of a certain age should be able to do. But Dr. Petiello points out the presence of symptoms does not necessarily mean a child has ADHD. Clinical evaluation needs to be made of a child showing behavioral issues that create problems at school, at home, or in social settings. Stimulant medications such as Adderall or Ritalin have been proven to be highly effective in controlling ADHD symptoms. But oftentimes the question is asked, how can stimulants be used to treat hyperactive behavior? They are correctly identified as stimulants because they stimulate the brain to pay attention, they stimulate the part of the brain that pertain to uh, executive functioning in particular, uh, so um, ability to efficiently uh, complete tasks. As the child performs more efficiently and is more focused, it may look that he is calm. 
indeed he is not just calm, he's just engaged in a task in a much more efficient and uh, focused way. In addition to advances in behavioral study of ADHD, remarkable strides in technology have given investigators an even clearer picture of the brain at work. There have been really huge advances in looking at the brains in kids with ADHD. The biggest single change has been the advent, you know, the, the arrival of magnetic resonance imaging, because that's safe. It doesn't involve any radiation. So we can scan children as they grow up, and we can scan them repeatedly, because the best way to capture a developmental problem like ADHD is to look at the same child over time as they're growing up. Of particular interest in recent research is charting the growth of the brain's cortex in children with ADHD. And one thing that we find, that the main finding, is that kids with ADHD show basically the same overall pattern of uh, brain development or cortical development. It's just that everything in kids with ADHD tends to be a bit slower. It's all a bit delayed. So the parts of the brain where this delay in maturation is most pronounced is at the front. There are the parts of the brain that are very important for the control of action and attention. And that gives us all sorts of new targets to look at for potential treatments in ADHD, things that we didn't think of looking at before. So, for example, if you find that um, the brain development case of ADHD is a bit delayed, that might suggest that we should start looking at the, the cell, the cellular mechanisms, the, the, the basics of why that might be the case. And that also then leads to thinking about all sorts of genes which might regulate the timing of brain development and how they might be a bit different in kids with ADHD. All this sort of work, working from the basic brain science and the basic genetics of ADHD, I think it gives us very good leads into future potential novel treatments for ADHD. To find out more about ADHD and information about locating mental health services in your area, go to nimh.nih.gov. All right. So it gave a great description as well as giving you some background research information. Um, one of the things, there was a time when children, that, what I appreciate about this video is that it explained about that some of the symptoms may appear to be uh, where someone, a child might look like they have ADHD and they do not. Um, and why it's really necessary for uh, an assessment to be conducted. Because there was a time when every child that demonstrated any type of behavioral issues were automatically wanting to be diagnosed with ADHD, which we discovered that's not the case. Um, so that I want you to just make sure y'all have a good understanding about, um, but we're gonna go ahead and move forward. All right, so just to give you a couple of reminders in terms of terminology when we're speaking about memory, Sensory memory, remember that's our ability to be able to take in information from based off our um, senses and it's really usually extremely brief in its raw form. With working memory, we're talking about short-term memory and it holds a little more information, just enough to allow us to be able to process that information as it moves from working into uh, long-term memory and that's basically our encoding processes. And then of course, think of our mind as a file cabinet, so to speak. Though that information that's gonna have true meaning and relativity to what we need in life really will be maintained in long-term memory. And usually it would be of permanent, uh, have permanence. Um, think about when you're riding a bike or once you learn how to drive a car the uh, mechanics of that is gone into long-term memory so that it's more of an automatic response now. You don't really have to think hard about it in order to perform it. All right, so now we're gonna look a little bit more in terms of talking about memory uh, and from infancy on through childhood, okay? So I have a couple of more videos and hopefully we can get through this. I might stop the video once it gives the information I want uh, as this uh, video lecture has become much longer than I anticipated. So I just wanna make sure we get that information in there though.
episodic memory is your memory for episodes in your life. So very specific autobiographical moments. It's always been a mystery why it is that children who are in their first two years of life are learning a lot about the world. They are learning the word banana, for instance. Um, and yet we don't remember events from our lives before the age of two. So I wanted to explain both why we seem to forget all of the events of our lives between zero and two, despite the fact that we're learning, as I said, words and lots of facts about the world. And then why between the age of two and six, um, our memories are you know, more fragmentary than they later will be. <gasps> and look, there are all these containers. Do you want to open them? And let's look and see if any of them have any toys inside. Which one do you want to open first? So we came up with this procedure where uh, kids go to two different rooms with two different experimenters. And those rooms look a bit different, they describe differently. One has clouds on the door, one has rainbows on the door. Uh, but in those rooms, there are four containers. The same four containers in the one room as in the other room. But the containers are also arranged differently. So there's many cues where the child knows, okay, now I'm in this room, now I'm in that room. And they also are shown that there's a specific toy in one of the containers, let's say at the turquoise shopping bag, in one of the rooms. And the other three containers contain nothing. So the question is whether they remember which is the good bag in the cloud room and which is the good bag in the rainbow room. The very youngest children um, couldn't remember which container contained the toy, even when we cued them in a very, very supportive way, which is we gave them part of the toy. So if you give, you know, those bubble juice things where you use a wand and you blow bubbles, if you give them the wand, we say, where's the bubble juice? They don't know. Now, suppose you don't give them the bubble wand. Now it's a little harder. Now the two-year-olds can't do it. And in fact, the three-year-olds really can't do it. And the four-year-olds get a little bit better. And we documented a gradual progression. It's not really till the age of five that children top this out. Can you remember where a toy was in here? Was it there? Let's see. <gasps> Oh my goodness, there they are. The part of everyday life that it relates to is that it's actually very important to social interaction to be able to uh, remember these kinds of experiences. So for instance, if your mother wants to know about your day in school, it's uh, important to her that you say whether or not you played with your friend Penny, whether or not you did well on your spelling test, um, you know, those kinds of things. And in fact, your parents are probably going to be a little dismayed if you can't remember if Penny was in school today or you, you know, whatever. Don't answer about did you like your peanut butter sandwich and these kinds of things. So it is very important to coordinating our social experience to be able to have episodic memory. All right. I let it play fully through, but. Think about how far back can you recall in your childhood? For me, I can only recall back to the age of five, actually. All the other information I have prior to that is actually information that's been shared with me through family. Uh, my son, on the other hand, my youngest son, he actually can recall things that occurred when he was at two years old. So. And it's without me giving, because some of the things he shares, I really have to stop and think about again uh, myself. So that's what we're talking about in terms of infantile amnesia. Uh, and it's through the episodic uh, memory. So there's major changes that's been happening in terms of when we discuss work and memory through child development. Remember, working memory is gonna hold a short term while it's taking in uh, the ability to solve problems and to decide if it's gonna be moved into long-term memory. So you have to remember that uh, with working memory, it allows you to be able to hold 
information in at the same time as you think about how it needs to be rearranged, so to speak, to fit within your world. Um, the memory of young children is very limited in capacity. So, for example, a five-year-old can hold maybe one or two pieces of information within their mind at a time. Practically speaking, it's, it's the saying that it, it, you put your book in a cubby, for example, as a textbook would describe, and then you would come sit at the table. But then that information in working memory might not actually translate in, into long-term memory uh, if the child doesn't feel that, you know, it was something to have meaning for them. Things that you want to recall is that our working memory is that time that it's encoding uh, and things that we're going by is going to be scripts, things that's given to us repeatedly, um, how it's organized, and how elaborate will it be. And when we talk about elaboration, we're also talking about how meaningful it would be. All right, so now we're in adolescence and pretty much I just want to share that with long-term and working memory, it's going to reach its peak around 11 or 12 years old, and it really doesn't change much after that. Once it's there, that's usually how, once we develop into adulthood, it's going to have the same type of um, instances. So what do change within adolescence is allowing the brain to be able to manage that working memory. And what you want to remember is, is that our prefrontal cortex uh, is what helps to develop and continue to develop actually during adolescence. And this is where the working memory is a key component for once they become an adult. Okay, so with that understand, the brain is going to start managing it, it's going to maintain that, and that's how we start uh, keeping things for the rest of our lives. Now, executive functioning. This is where uh, there's a coordination of how we pay attention to things, how we're able to uh, look at things, take in the meaning, allow it to go into our long-term memory. Uh, it's going to help guide us in terms of how we would approach problem solving and our goals. Uh, one of the things you want to just recall is with inhibitions, this is whether or not our mind is saying, do we stay on the task at hand or can we ignore those distractions that's placed before us? Um, also in terms of cognitive flexibility, this is allowing us, when we try to do multitasking, this is where cognitive flexibility comes into play because it allows us to switch focus as we need to in order to complete a task. Um, sometimes there's a task that we have that has several steps within it. Well, with cognitive flexibility, we have that ability to do so. And finally, planning. It's that ability to think things through first before we attempt to complete our goals and tasks. So your textbook talks about the Tower of Hanoi, and you make sure you read that. It'll give you good information there. Finally, talking about metacognition. <clears throat> In terms of metacognition, this is where we're able to monitor our thoughts and how we think and how we actually start to do problem solving. Again, meta is meaning we're doing more than one thing at a time. With theory of mind, we're looking at how others play uh, within our understanding of our experiences and mental states and how we would use that in order for us to think about not just ourselves, but of the world around us. So finally, we're just going to come back and I'm not going to read this all to you. We went through this extensively today, but just to recap, we went through Piaget's uh, stages of cognitive development. We talked about the, Thor, the theory of core um, knowledge. We looked at Vygotsky's social cultural theory. And then finally, we ended with information processing theory. And those are the four theories that we utilize within cognitive development. This will end our uh, video lecture for the week. Okay, you will have an assignment that will be due on Friday. 
and don't worry I'm not going to put any links to any type of articles this week since we had a struggle I will be uploading an article that I want you to review uh, there's no questions to an, an, uh, answer for it but I do want you to go ahead and read it uh, that will go along with the assignment so on that note I hope you do have a great week and again if you have questions quests or concerns you know you can reach me in the inbox I check my inbox faster than I do my email so please utilize canvas inbox before sending me an email um, as I can focus more on canvas because that's where we're working from extensively on that note I'm hoping that you are still taking care of yourselves make sure that you are doing not only just your school work but giving yourselves a few minutes times during these stressful days that we have ahead of us you take care and we'll talk again next week